release the Quacken. Greetings, fellow game designers. Ron here at Lame Dog Studios. And today I want to talk to you about another game that I've been working on for quite a while, which is Blockout. Now, Blockout is not the official title of the game, but it is a working title, and I may change it at some point. But essentially, it is a Arkanoid-style game. If you guys remember Arkanoid, um, here's a picture of it up here. It's that game where you kind of bounce the ball, and it broke some stuff. Um, sometimes you'll see it as Brick bl uh, Breaker, or Block Breaker, or something to that effect. Somewhere, uh, another one named for it would be like Breakout, um, and so on. Now this is a game that I made many, many years ago when I first started teaching game design. Um, and I taught it as, I was a game maker one project, I think, and we built it, um, we all built our very different versions of it. And it was pretty fun. Uh, the one that I built, I liked. A lot of my students built their own versions. And um, I decided maybe I would take this a step further and uh, do something else with it. So I continued working on it here and there, adding some things, tweaking some things. And I went through the process of you know, building these really intricate sprite sheets and tile maps. I'll go ahead and pull one up for you. Uh, so here is a uh, tile map for the inside of the ship. And you can see how it's all kind of laid out. And I'll just go ahead and zoom in on this. And these are all different tiles. I think these are 32 by 32. Um, there's the grid to kind of make it a little bit easier. And these are all broken up so they can be assembled inside of Game Maker. This is inside of Game Maker 2. And you can see the layout of all these and the different uh, tiles here. And this is the more recent version of the game. We have this wonderful screen here. Fade in. And a start. Let's go ahead and kill the volume on that. Actually, I'll, I'll leave the volume on. I'll just bring it down some. And that drops us into here. Now, some of this is here for testing. These um, are not really supposed to be in this level. Uh, this one is. Um, this one isn't. But these are. And the, it's kind of like a breakout or blockout or, or the other ones. Um, left and right movement on the, on the game. It works really well on the pad. Um, but the ball movement, so unlike um, Arkanoid where you bounce the ball, and um, kind of ricochet it, you, this is momentum based. So I can fire and it, it'll bounce off of stuff, but I can't let it hit me. If I let it hit me, boom, it does damage. So you have to do that, you have to dodge the debris. So I can fire this off. Oh, yeah, these aren't supposed to be here, so that, that's why. Um, but you can, um, you know, deflect and damage the other uh, ball. And the debris also hits you, so if I were to hang out under here and catch the debris, I would get caught by that. Um, and then different color balls deal a different amount of damage. You kind of get in here. This is going to be a bit tricky, just because these shouldn't be here, but it's okay. And then you drop items as you kind of go through. And then that'll change the color of the ball. Um, it's based on points. So a red ball, or a red ball, so the order is uh, red, yellow, blue, green. So I know it's not colorblind friendly. I'm aware of that. Different color palette coming soon. But um, in general, um, the higher order color will activate the lower color gate. Um, but a lower color cannot activate um, the higher color gate. So a red ball will not activate a yellow, blue, or green gate, but a uh, green, blue, or yellow can activate a red gate. That's kind of how the rule uh, works there. And you see I keep getting caught in the gate there. I'll go ahead and turn one of these, turn these gates off. Um, it's been a while since Game Maker, but let me jump in Mission 1 here. And I'll just get rid of these gates. Uh, bum, bum, bum. Gate layer. 
I'll just move these out of the way here. They're there for testing purposes, but it's whatever. Go ahead and break these. And then, like I said, the, uh, the movement is momentum based. So uh, the angle of the ball is based on how fast the ship moves. So if I move a little bit and fire, I'll get a low angle. If I move a lot of bit and fire, I get a hard angle or a, more, a sharper angle. So it creates some interesting uh, gameplay. And everybody who's test played the game really enjoys the sound effects. They love that. So here we go. Got some points, uh, some bonus time, next level. And here we are. One that's not obstructed by weird things. And you can see the doors are color coded. So this door has this um, yellow on here. So that means I have to use the yellow gate. Again, the colors are not colorblind friendly. I'm aware of that. Uh, one step at a time, but ultimately, yes. So I'll go ahead and just break some of these out. And bust these. And it is very satisfying to play. Um, and that's one of the sad things about the games. I really like this version of the game. And I, I say that because there is a, um, a different version, which I'll show uh, as I conquer these levels here. Uh, at, at current, there are about three main versions of the game. There's the older one from the original design, um, which still exists. It's actually built into this one, so once you get past all the levels, it's an unlockable. Um, but I love story. So as I was creating this, I was designing, um, I was getting into how the, who the robot was and, and what his mission was. And I started creating this story, which is how this you know, spaceship kind of came along. And the more I developed that, the more I thought, what if this was a kind of action puzzle sort of adventure type game? And so I got more into Arkanoid because Arkanoid has a lot of those features. It's got some story elements to it, but it is still in this format. And um, let me get that here. Oh. You see that oh, another thing is the uh, the higher order of the color, you get more bounces out of it. So red will bounce three times. Um, and they're, they're in orders of three, or multiples of three, so uh, red is three, the yellow is six, the blue is nine, and then the, um, the green is twelve. And they also go up in damage, so the, like a red ball might take five or six hits to crack a green block, but a green ball will break just about everything in one hit. So, and I'll just kind of bounce this in here, see if I can get... Good angle. Uh oh, that's dangerous. And these windows, uh, they're, they're supposed to suck you up, but that's not um, that's not in this version currently. There we go. You see these kind of get more and more elaborate. This one now has a secondary door, and there's a door here. So there are. Um, Again, there's a story element to this, and there are workers that are supposed to be coming in to try to dismantle you. And they'll come in through um, these unmarked doors. They'll open up and they'll come in. And you have to uh, take them down. But there's a there's a catch, which is... I don't really want to spoil it, but it's, it's in there. Um, let me go ahead and crack this so you can kind of see what's going on. I don't know if you noticed, but the blocks actually changed because these are the old style blocks. Um, and there's a thing that checks what level you're on, and my numbering is off, so it reset the blocks, the wrong thing. But anyway, so I unlocked this gate. And yeah, this is not going underneath. The updated version of this, you do go underneath. There's also an updated version of the ship here. But here you go. So you have this area. And there's supposed to be a robot in here that you free. You have to crack this window. There's actually a window here. Oops. <clears throat> I ended up unlocking the gate. 
And if you un if you unlock the gate, you don't crack the crack this window, then you don't rescue the robot, you don't get the, the points for that. So here is the older version of the game, and this is a really fun version of it. This is very speed based. Um, and I can crack these and have a have a grand old time with it. Um, so once you complete the maximum number of levels from the primary game, you unlock the secondary game. Um, which right now is just a seamless transition. <laughs> there's, there's no uh, menu or anything like that, but it, it was intended to be in like a menu system. And, um, this older version of the game required you to get all the blocks. The newer version, you don't have to get all the blocks, but um, you do have to open the doors. Getting the blocks is secondary, um, and then you have your submissions of getting all the blocks or rescuing all the robots. So there's adding the story element in. You can see these get more elaborate as you go. Now one thing, one new thing I want to point out is in the start menu of this, when this boots up, these wonderful fade ins, these are not handled using um, the Game Maker 2's uh, scene editor. That was not available when I built this. So all of these transitions are faded in by hand. So I did those in code. So I'll, I'll bring up the code for that. Let me jump into my game objects here. So system, uh, game object. And then if I jump into uh, my uh, GUI, I have my draw event. And if we are in the appropriate game state, this loads in each individual um, layer of that menu. So the the lights in the beginning, the background, the ship, uh, those are all layers that are stacked onto each other and um, there's some transparency overlay. And those are all driven here by hand. Um, with one of the newer releases of Game Maker 2, they have a um, a scene builder. Where What is it called here? Uh, bum, 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 bum. Sequencer, yeah. So and they have a sequence menu, which I don't have over here, but um, you can build sequences to help you do this this kind of transitional stuff. But that wasn't there when I built it. But anyway, um, I did say that there was another version of this, and I went ahead and built it in Unreal. So as I got deeper into the story and I fleshed out the characters, I wanted to make an adventure game out of it. <clears throat> so this is blockout adventure game. Same kind of transition inside of Unreal. Now you can see that this is much more crisp because it's a um, more of a advanced 3D kind of game. Um, I took away the uh, the pixelated look of it, so it's much more crisp. And of course if I don't click on the menu, same kind of thing happens. It'll reset the menu again. And then if you hit new game, it brings you into the story mode. And then it loads you into the main game. Um, the music created, by the way, this is done by Elijah Mullins. He is my musician. Fantastic. Uh, if you need music, I will point you in the direction of him. Um, but here is the main game so far, and it is just a 3D version of the game. Um, controls, not ideal at the moment. I'm, I'm still working on those, but you can see the game layouts. Some things have changed. Some things are new. You still have these junction boxes and of course you can uh, fire at them to open the gate. Right now there's nothing outside of here so I can kind of come out and explore space but um, later on of course there's going to be more ship there but it's a thing. You can see the dismantled ship here. There will be bodies in this area um, and of course there's a door on this end can't quite see it, but you can 
it is there. It's a blue gate, and there's a blue um, thing here. I can't activate it because it's the wrong color. Uh, window over here. You can see the planet that's hanging out over there, and it does spin. If I hang out, you can see it's uh, rotating. And this little guy, because it is an adventure game, there's some story. And if I talk to him, we get a wonderful story. Wow, that was incredible. You really showed them. What? You mean you don't remember? Oh, my circuits. They must have knocked something loose. Here, let me refresh your memory banks. You are Defense Drone 1701. Um, that's a Star Trek reference. I don't know if you know that. You know, you can't get more into the story. You know, yada, yada. Um, and I'm Record Access Station 1123. Or you can just call me RAS1123 for short. Listen, ever since we passed into this nebula, the humans have been screwy. Maybe if you get the engines going and set us free, things will go back to normal. You're currently in Cargo Bay 3. Main engineering is through the blast door behind you, but you'll need to upgrade your energy pulse to the designated color to get through. What's that? They really did a number on you, didn't they? You can release an energy pulse by pressing the action key, but keep an eye on your power cells. If you get too low, you'll be lucky to cast sparks. The junction boxes on the doors respond to specific energies. Just match the colors and you'll be set. Would you like to save your progress? And of course you have the option, you can save, it'll save, or you can say no. Um, so if I hit it, there'll be a save, and then you'll exit. Um, it's actually supposed to say data confirmed, but it did not do that this time. So this version of it isn't going to be the exact same. There's going to be some puzzle element to it for breaking the blocks, um, but it's going to be more action oriented. Uh, Trouble is, I, I can't do things simple. I always have to advance them, so it, it, it makes um, makes it complicated. Feature creep is a real thing, so uh, keep an eye on that. Now, if you, if you saw back here, I do have different versions of this opening theme because I hired um, multiple musicians to take care of this. Maybe uh, one day I'll play them all. Um, you can hear them. I'll add, maybe I'll add like a link so you can you can hear all those. And you can kind of vote on the one that you like the most. Um, I picked the one that I like the most, and I think Elijah did a fantastic job. He did all the music for this one, and there's also a uh, an ending screen. So when you die, there's this one. So I'll go ahead and bring this one up just so you can see it. So when you're when you finally die, you're all broken. It kind of blinks and it kind of fades out. And there's a there's a death music that goes with this as well. Now for the dialog, I went ahead and built a dialog manager um, that pulls data from a data bank. If I open this up, you can kind of see um, there's dialog here. It's broken up into different chapters, and those chapters are pulled in as needed. And um, you can see these are kind of broken down uh, here. And then if I go into data, you can see I have a conversation list that checks you know, which conversation I've been in, what, what the speaker is, what the chapter is. And there's an event list because different events will change the dialog chapter. Then inside of my system here, if I go down and grab my dialog component here, you can see that my dialog manager, how it works. Um, it gets dialog from data, pulls that in um, as needed. And it kind of goes through and figures out who the speaker is, and what should be said. Now one thing that kind of happens is once you're in uh, and you've talked to the robot, you should be able to actually examine this little guy here. And you can see um, that this pops up. Before you talk to him, um, this is not accessible. You have to actually speak to him and hear that the robots have been damaged before you can get to this. And that's one of those little chapter things in the menu. And then we're kind of setting up a little bit of a subplot. We have to kind of go and find the pieces of these guys and reassemble them as you kind of go through the level. Now for the actual level design, the way I did this, um, each one of these pieces is, is a different 
um, chunk. So the 2D version of the game, when it comes to like sprites and stuff, I don't know. My brain has a hard time dealing with you know 2D anything because I, I interpret that as a lot of extra work that I could simplify by making things 3D, and I can reuse assets that way, and then I can just swap out textures and that sort of thing. And to me, that seems a to make a lot more sense um, overall. So all these pieces are you know modular; they can kind of come out, and I can you know, swap these out for different different things. Now I do have different versions of like the windows, so some I have them shorter, longer, I have thinner, wider to kind of, you know, vary the aesthetic. Um, you can see if I go to my list here of all of my static meshes, um, material should not be in here, oops, but if I kind of come down you can see all the different static meshes that make up this stuff. Um, you know, like the doors, they're kind of their own thing. This is a blueprint with its various pieces. Uh, we have some little, you know, lighting uh, accessories here, kind of add to the world. Um, these pipes are useful. Now, one of the, another thing about um, 2D versus 3D, this is one thing I try to hammer with my students because they're, they're always like, you know, Mr. Flowers, we should do, uh, we want, really want to do a 2D game. I'm like, well, in my opinion, you're making your life harder because, for example, if I jump into um, this sprite map here, this tile map, I have to make each different version of these pipes. I have to have a pipe that goes, you know, horizontally. I have to have a pipe that goes vertically. And then I have to render a position for each one of these pipes. You see this? I don't have the luxury of just rotating it. Um, each one of these junction boxes, I have to make one this way, I have to make one that way. I have to make sure the lighting is rendered correctly on each one of those. Um, that becomes a pain. All of these tile sets for the floor, I have to make sure each one is rendered and has different lighting effects. Um, now, th there are some things, they've made some improvements with 2D design, where, like, especially with, like in GameMaker uh, and Godot, um, you can have 2D lights that do affect your environment, which is nice because it takes away some of the extra work you have to do. Um, but you're still stuck with rotation. Like this uh, ventilation panel, I have to have four different versions of it because I there are four different possible directions that you would see this from, uh, different angles you can see it from. Um, these corners, I have to have four different corners. I have to have four different... Um, center sections, right? I just have to, some flat tiles. Um, the doors, I have to have these in four different possible directions for the doors, right? And then each one of those doors has to be set up with an animation component so that the doors can open, right? I have to create one from each different angle. Um, and I also have to create not just the doors, but the thing that goes around the door, you know? And I have down here, you know, different lighting pieces, uh, different walls that have different angles, different pieces of glass, right? Whereas if I do this in 3D, I can take this pipe and I can suddenly say, hey, you know, maybe I want this pipe to be this way. And look at that. The lighting gets updated. I only have to do this, you know, once. And maybe I make a couple different pipe designs, like this one's a double-ended pipe. Uh, these are pipes that end at the floor but I can reuse those assets. I don't have to worry about um, having to make a million of them. I can make a couple of them, and then I can swap out textures, which makes life a lot easier. Um, the floor, for example, this is, instead of it being a bunch of repeated tiles, this is one piece, and then this is a texture. And I can take this texture and vary um, how many repetitions are on this texture, how many uh, tiles are on there. Um, these little brackets here that kind of line up with the wall, these are modular. I can take this and break this off and suddenly I have a different wall type, right? I have an unsupported wall type. The door, you know, I can take this door and suddenly, you know, it's a door that swings this way. 
and it still works. I can run the game and this is still going to work. I don't have to do any additional coding. I can jump into here and I can fire at this uh, junction box. The door still opens. I can still go through it. It still works, right? Um, so that's kind of like the beauty of, of working in 3D design is I have a little bit more flexibility with the assets that I build. Um, now there are some variations that I've made. I've made different walls to kind of change up the aesthetics. So like this one, I did make these with, um, you know, there's actually a physical angle in here. You can see this little uh, cross pattern. That's actually physically part of the model. But I can vary up the texture if I want to. I can make these as floor pieces. I can change them around. Um, and then in here, yeah, this is one of those cases where I did have a separate piece. Um, but here's like the middle section there. And this is another thing that I, lo I love about Unreal that isn't really a feature in Unity. Um, if I wanted, so Unreal has, has the BSP system, so the binary space partition, um, the general geometry that I can pull in, you know, I can pull in a basic shape and I can do live edits on this thing. Um, if I need to have a hole cut in to a surface, I can do that. I can change its shape. And then suddenly I can make this, you know, subtractive and I can make a hole into a shape. I don't have to go back into Maya and do an export and make a specific wall shape. I can do that. So like a lot of my floors, that's how they are. These are BSPs, and then this is a section that's been cut out, and then I have a texture on it, which makes my workflow a lot smoother. Um, there are some plugin additions inside of Unity that allow you to do something like this, but I don't know. It's, it's one of those things that's kind of clunky. Um, but that's one of the things I love about Unreal is how flexible it is. Now, there are some things that I despise about Unreal, um, which is Unreal is built to be a first-person shooter um, engine. You know, out of the box, that's what it builds. So if you want to do something like this, there's a lot of extra work you have to do to turn all of those features off. Whereas if you were to do this in Unity, it comes bare bone right out of the gate. So you just turn on the features you need. You don't have to find extra stuff and turn it off. So there, there's a give and a take. But from a building standpoint, I do appreciate the edit the the quickness and ease of use of Unreal as far as you know level design. That's, that's a nice feature. Um, yeah, so this is uh, block out the adventure version of the game in a nutshell. Uh, let me know what you think down in the comments. Should I continue working on block out 2D? Should it be its own standalone game? Or should it be a something that's integrated on top of um, Blockout 3D, or should I do Blockout 2D as just a mobile game and have Blockout 3D be a Steam game where you can play on PC with a you know controller and that sort of thing? Um, interested in what you think? And uh, yeah, I shall see you next time. Hey guys, thanks for checking out my channel. <laughs> Misty and I both thank you. If you enjoyed that video you just watched, make sure you hit that like button and subscribe. Also, if you'd like to support the channel, uh, check out our online merch. You can get that on Amazon or at a Teespring store. Uh, the links for that are in the description below. And now for the new and exciting thing that I've been working on the past uh, like month or two is our first official cryptocurrency, which is Stepdad Doge. So Stepdad Doge is a uh, BEP20 token, uh, totally for the memes, you know, not to the moon anytime soon is our as our big slogan and of course he's been keeping the kids in line um, I, I wanted to do keeping the kids in line since 1949 but that's not true so I just, I just left it at this um, but yeah this is what, what I'm working on making the uh, little page here and being kind of cute with it if you want to see more about you know the token and all that stuff you can check out our about page you'll see the team of course I'm the token creator and then Marcus and Becca they were kind of like some, some of the spiritual uh, advisors into this um, so it's like I want to make a token. I don't know what I want it to do or what I want it to be. And uh, so we kicked around that idea, and this is the idea that kind of popped up. So you can kind of read about the token, what the what the project is. There is a one trillion uh, coin cap. It's not going to you're not going to be mint, minting any of these, and you're not going to be burning any of these. And we'll get back to burning in just a second. There is a fee for all transactions, which is four percent. 
That way there's something always going back into the coin, so there's always something to be available. And then there is, of course, a staking fee or a um, staking reward. So as you're holding it, you gain some coins back, 3%. Now, in, ter in terms of burning the coin, um, I don't think it's a good idea to burn something that you want to actually have value. That's kind of like a, a scheme with pump and dumps. You know, they're like, "Oh, this coin will burn X amount of coins, and then it'll rate, it'll artificially inflate the price, and then you'll get, um, you'll be able to pull out and get some money out of it." My thoughts on that are: if you want a coin to be usable, and you want to be able to make trades with it and whatever then having the supply of that token or coin diminish with trades means at some point you're going to run out of coins to trade. Um, so it just doesn't, doesn't make economical sense to me. So I did not make a burn in this coin. I want it to be useful. One of the things we want to do is make it so that you can purchase our merch with it. There is, of course, merch, which is awesome. You can check out the merch page. Um, this is the basic stuff we have here. And you can gain... All of it, of course, on our Teespring store. That brings you here, and you can see various um, products and such. Um, at the moment, you cannot purchase anything with the tokens directly because I don't know how to set that up yet. Working on it. But I do want to be able to start at this point and, of course, offer uh, games that I'm selling using the token. I was going to have a different token in mind, but I think this is going to be a fun one. And yeah, it's, it's just going to have something that you can exchange with because more things that you can buy with it, the um, the better the longevity of the project and the more value it's ultimately going to ultimately going to have. And then of course, as far as like transparency and trades and stuff, you can you can read that here and what we've done um, at the present time. You can also see more about the token on Binance uh, BNB. So if you go to BNB or BinanceScan.com. Uh, you can take the token address, we go to the investment page here, and you can go down to the bottom and grab the uh, contract address, and just go ahead and paste that in, and you can get more information about it. So here is the page so far. Um, I'm still in the works of getting the symbol approved, because I, I have to have so many trades and whatever not to get all that stuff. But um, you can see it here. Uh, current value and all that stuff, really there's, there's no value in it except for what I've already put into it. I think overall I put about $1,500 into um, creating and setting up and doing liquidity for the token and, and some other stuff. Um, and you can see the current transactions and all that on the coin. You can check that out. You can check out the contract. You can check out um, you know, how the contract's built. It's all here and whatever not. As far as um, trading, if you want to get a hold of it, it is available on PancakeSwap currently. Um, it trades for BNB, and you can, of course, go into, um, once you connect your wallet, you can go down and paste the uh, contract address, and then add it. Now, if you haven't added it yet, um, it will say, hey, anybody can make a token. Anybody can make a token here, and uh, it'll give you a warning. Make sure that you understand who you're getting it from, and if it's approved and it's official. But yeah, the contract address should take you there. And then it'll exchange for BNB. I don't actually have any BNB in this wallet, but you can exchange for it. I want to make it so it's exchangeable across other uh, BEP20 tokens, so like uh, Wife Doge, um, Baby Doge. There's, of course, uh, Shiba Coin, which is an ERC token. Um, I'm going to see if I can get that working as well, but um, I don't have that up just yet. But the more things you can trade it with, the, the more options you have as far as like liquidity and, and uh, trading and such. So, so yeah, so if you jump down and you actually go to the investment page, I do recommend not investing in this um, unless it's something that you really want to do because this is a meme project. It is, of course, my first project. I don't have any intention of abandoning it because I, I think it's kind of neat, but um, you got to know your sources and be, be vigilant about that sort of stuff. So I can't give financial advice and say, get this, but if you want it and you really want to support the meme, then by all means, uh, help us out. Um, the more people who are getting involved in this, then the more likely we can get this on other exchanges and we can get um, sort of the ball rolling. I might do a crowdfunding page to kind of help uh, build that up. I haven't um, given out any coins or anything like that. I think for the upcoming future, I might do some giveaways, but we'll, we'll get to that um, a little bit later down the line. But anyway, yeah, so that's just us in a nutshell, what we've been doing. If you want to of course, contact us on this page, you're more than welcome to. And there's some merch. And 
yeah. Anyway, hopefully I'll see you on the next round next time.